And we're going to talk about the tests of leadership. Of course, this is remembering that, that leadership is not necessarily people appointed with positions and titles, but those who are moved upon by the Lord, those who have certain giftings, those who are flowing with those that movement and that gifting, and they are finding their place. And uh, I'm convinced that uh, the title elders in the scripture originally was appointed to those who were saved longer than others because the church had just started and then, you know, they had some who had been around a little bit longer so they said, okay, you guys are elders because they were winning so many new people but everybody has been new, you know. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, just a lot of the things that we call titles weren't titles at all. They said, okay, you guys are elders. Deacons, you're the deacon and servants. You know, you servants, you're, you know, we, we made a title out of it. When it was really more or less a function. You know, it wasn't a title, you know. And yet somebody says, oh, give me a title and I'll be there. And that's not the truth, is it? You know, you can give people titles and they're not necessarily what they're supposed to be. But you can also withhold titles from certain people, and they are still what they are. Amen? So remember that, because that's important, because there will be a day when things will be withheld from you. All right? That's just a fact. All right. We're going to talk about some of those kind of tests. Verse uh, 10 says, And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of the deacon be found blameless. Now, I'm not really speaking of not necessarily deacons, but the fact that certain things have to be proved. And the facing of these things, of different things that I'm about to go over, and passing these tests, is really what develops Christ in you. It develops the, the nature of Christ. It develops the uh, character and the freedom of flowing with Him in these things. And, you know, it says, let need to be proven. That means you need to be tested. Uh, time will tell when these things begin to come into your life what you're going to be like. And this is this is the bottom line. I've always said this and I, I learned it from the Lord when I was in Bible school. The Lord showed me as I, I was a young Christian. He said, Randy, the rest of your Christian life, the rest of your ministry, the rest of your Christianity is in front of you. Everything that you do now is like a little planter thing. And you're going to be planting seeds. And whatever seeds you plant is going to be your future. And he said you can determine your future by planting. You, you see how I mean, a farmer determines his future doesn't he? by picking what seeds he wants, nurturing them, tending them. <coughs> And in the future, all that future is present. Amen? It starts all coming up. <clears throat> and the Lord just really made it clear to me that, <clears throat> that whatever I put in there is going to come up. And so <clears throat> he began to speak to me about, you know, don't be griping at me 10 years from now when a bunch of bad weeds and stuff's coming up around you and you're going, oh, why is this and why that and why, you know, and why is everything so tough and everything? He said, you, you plan it all. You know, you, you reap what you sow. You plan it all that and that's your, what you're going to get. Now, what he was telling me was, be careful. Now, realize that what you're doing now not just affects what's going to come your way. Certainly it affects it. But it is what's coming to me. And so you find that little test like <clears throat> when there's a situation, um, will you put your hand to that? Or will you let God do it? For example, Abraham in the situation with Ishmael. You know, well, I'm getting too old and it's not going to happen. Maybe what God wanted me to do was to have Ishmael on my own. And of course we all know that that's not what God wanted me to do. 
situation of Saul when he was waiting for Samuel to come. And the enemy was all around them and he had the opportunity to wait until the priest came and offer the sacrifice and then have the blessing of God and go out. Or he sat there and sat there and the enemy getting closer and closer and he said, you know what, we got to have this sacrifice. This sacrifice must take place. And since the priest didn't hear, I'm going to do it. Well, you know, the king is not a priest, amen? He pro projected himself into the office of another and into the anointing, into the place, into the calling, into the position of another. And, of course, you know, as soon as he did it, what happened? Samuel come walking. Isn't that funny how that worked? As soon as he did it, then Samuel walks up and goes, Woe unto you! And, you know, the kingdom shall be taken from you! And, and he's going, Gee whiz, you didn't give me much time to get over this, did you? You know? And that's the deal. You know, there are things that we need to learn that have nothing to do with how to ramrod a group of people into what God wants them to do. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, um, it is not first and foremost about what you do, but the spirit in which it's done. And that's really, 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 really the truth. Now, you know, you say, well, yeah, but you're supposed to say stuff like that. No, no, I, I'm not supposed to. I'm, you know, I'm not paid to do that because I'm not, Hey, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's not the you know, The deal is, is that I know that that is the truth before the Lord. <clears throat> that all the things that we can do matters nothing. What matters is the spirit in which we do it. And then God many times will bless what we do. But the truth is, there are people who do things in a wrong spirit and God even blesses them, doesn't he? Okay. And we say, well, then, you know, Lord, bless me. And that's up to him. But, you know, whatever you're doing right now, if he blesses it, if you sow the wrong seeds, those seeds are still going to come up. You know. So, you know, there are so many situations where before we get into those situations where we have a, a choice or a position to do something or to have a, or in a position of influence, Way before that, there are important things that God wants to work in every one of us. And, and I'm telling you, if you care anything about God, if you care anything about the kingdom of God, if you care anything about your ministry, if you care anything about others, you will now take the time to start right, get it right, and set the course for it to be right in the future. Amen? I mean, that's what's important. And anything short of that is just us out there, you know, and, you know, we, we're turning the Christians loose every day on the, you know, uh, you know, we go, we have these uh, short-term mission things, and we have these conferences, and we say, you know, do you have the desire? Yeah! Do you want to take the world for Jesus? Yeah! Do you want, yeah! And everybody loves to go to those things and shout and run around and feel spiritual and everything else. And without any character built, without Christ formed in us, we unloose these people out there. And, you know, most of the stuff doesn't last. Most of the ministries that are started that way don't last. Um, and most of the ministers that start that way, I mean, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Amen? Yeah. And what was, and that, that scripture was in reference to who? Jews. The Jews. And in reference to what? They went to the temple, they read the Bible, they kept the ordinances, they were totally separated under God. They had a society and an environment totally separated to God. And when the person of the Godhead that was sent to represent all of that showed up, they missed him. Because they didn't know him. And ultimately that's it. We want to know him. And when I say know him, um, you know, there is this, this oneness and union with the Lord that is a knowing that is so beyond the intellectual. And many do not know that. And that's why when circumstances happen that seem to say God doesn't love you, nakedness or peril or nothing shall separate me, but 
and I'm naked or I'm in peril, and where's God? <clears throat> we say that. Where's God? Or why doesn't God love me? Or God seems to love so and so and deliver them, and look what I'm going through. We have not come to the love of God that passes knowledge. You know that's a scripture, don't you? We have we, we know the knowledge of the love of God, but let me tell you, knowledge of love is different than knowing that love. Yes. Amen? Yes. It's different. And many have never, ever, ever stepped out of the knowledge that God, God loves us. You know, you know I've seen, I, I, I've, you know, count, counseled husbands and wives, and, and I've had, you know, husbands or wives say, well, I, I just don't think, you know, I don't, wife, so I don't think he loves me. I just don't think he loves me. Say, well, what are you basing that on? Well, he just, you know, this, you know, sometimes it is. Well, you know, that's true that nobody loves God because look at our attitude sometimes. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not based on attitudes or moments or anything like that. And we're going to, we have to get beyond the feel of something. And, and know, know it beyond knowing. Know it so much that when peril, when nakedness, when tribulation, when all this stuff comes, we say, you know what, I'm persuaded of the love of God. And somebody standing next to you says, well, what do you have to prove to persuade it? I said, I, I don't go by these things. I know it. It is beyond my circumstances. Glory to God. And I tell you what, very few people will last very long in the kingdom of God. I mean, in the kingdom, not, you know, tinkering with ministry, without deeply knowing the love of God that is in Christ Jesus for us. And I mean, knowing it beyond knowledge, knowing it beyond circumstances. Because the devil knows human nature. And you're not human nature. You're, you're what we call born again. Hallelujah. You are born from above. Yes. And everything about you is to be up, not down. Yes. Seek those things which are above, not on the earth. It didn't say not earthly things. Oh, I don't seek earthly things. I seek spiritual things. But it's all down here. He said, seek those things which are above, above your five senses, above your thoughts. Did it say that his thoughts are above your thoughts? His ways are above? It didn't say they're bigger. It didn't say they're bigger. It said they're above. There's a big difference. And that's because our senses are below. Our viewpoints are below. Our desires are below. Our thoughts are, and, and concerns are below. But his is not. He, he is working I mean, what is, what is, uh, I was writing about this uh, yesterday. I was just handwriting a whole bunch of stuff, and I was thinking about this, this reality, and I was thinking, you know, growth, growth is nothing more than moving toward the upward call. Isn't it? Everything that grows moves up. It moves towards the sun. It moves away from the earth. It grows. Growth is not linear on a line that says, I was here and now I'm over there. Growth is, I was this entrenched in the earth, and I'm this much closer to the above reality of Christ. Yeah. Amen? Growth. Maturity. You have a maturity in you. I don't care what you've been through. If you're still earthbound and earth chained. And... Amen? Yeah. I mean, really, that's yeah. the truth. We have not truly grown because we still see. What, what, is, what is resurrection? Growing up. What is dead? Six feet up. Amen? The earth is more earth, deeper into the earth. So I'm going to tell you that I don't care how alive you seem to be in the earth, you're dead. As long as everything is based on the earth. But when you are based from above, when you are based in Christ, and David said, if the mountains be removed, if the seas are taken away, if everything is lost, I will stand with the I am with the Lord, and the Lord is with me. And man, that's a reality because you, you know, you're young and you know, well, life is good. You know, well, no, life isn't good. 
I mean, I hate to say that, but I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know too many people that talk like this, so just mark me off as a, as a cynic who has just, you know, been through too much stuff. And it's just burnout. It's a burnout here. I'm not a burnout here. I'm not burned out at all. But there, but this earth, Jesus said, you must hate your life in this earth. And I don't know a whole lot of people that do. In fact, I know a whole lot of people that are trying to get the very one who said that to bless their life in this earth to such a degree that they love their life in this earth. Is that right or wrong now? I mean, if you got a Bible, you can check me out. Is that right or wrong? You know? But there, but I'm not talking about heaven. I'm talking about heavenly places. I, you know, I'm in the world, but I'm not of it. And I'm separating more and more so that so that all of the things, you know, folks, if if you're laying there and you've been in a war, you Vietnam and everything, and bombs going off everywhere and Boom, you're hit here and your arm, you know, is not totally severed, but it's it's dead and bang, your leg, you know, and it's, you know, the bone is broken and everything, and you're laying there and and the the, the captain comes walking up with a sword and he pokes that leg or that arm, you don't feel anything because it's dead. Well the captain of your salvation folks, right at the place where you're alive. And that's why it hurts. And that's why it hurts you, because it's alive. It hurts because it's alive. And we're supposed to take up the cross. We're supposed to follow Jesus. We're not supposed to follow Jesus. We're supposed to take up the cross, deny ourselves, and follow Jesus. Now that's what the Word of God says. And those are the terms for following Jesus. So the bottom line is, do we want to follow Jesus? Now, we can't say, man, we got to go, we, we can't say, yes, I want to follow Jesus, the one in the long white robe with the beard and the precious hands that are nail scarred that reach out and says, I love you. How much did I love you this much? And you go, oh, I want to follow you. You do beautiful, you know. <laughs> you know? Oh, Jesus, you just, everything is just, you know, you make me feel warm and fuzzy. Uh, if you're dead, there ain't a lot of fuzzy. <laughs> or warm. Amen? The truth is, to follow Jesus, you cannot, and society has done that. Christian society has done that. It has denied taking up the cross, and it has denied the Lord but it has not denied itself. Jesus didn't say, if any man follow me, deny the cross. Did it. But that's what people have done. He said, deny yourself. Okay? Hate your life in this world. Say, well, you know, I, I know what you You know, I, I thought it, okay? There, I'm not telling you, nor was Jesus, Immediately, right now, understand everything that I'm saying, and no, I'm trying to speak to something in you that deeply loves Jesus, so if you'll let that come to the forefront, you will go after the Lord. It's called counting the cost without really understanding the fullness, because you don't understand the fullness of the cost. You don't know what it's going to take and what you're going to have to go through. And many of you, and probably most of you, maybe all of you, if you have any clue what you're going to be going through, turn back right now and run away screaming. All right? But I'm going to tell you something. The closer you come to death, the closer you come to life. The closer you come to his death, the less pain you're going to have concerning this life. And like I said, the, that probing in the Lord is, he just knows how to do it. He knows, he, he's not poking around on dead parts. He knows what's dead in you. You go, wow, what is this going on? Ooh, you know, I mean, I know what, I know what I'm talking about, you know. You know, and you go, I thought I kept that hid from him. You know, no, 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 he knows what's alive in you. You know what I mean? And, it, and then you, you go, oh, and the Spirit of God says to me, that hurts because you're alive. I thought I was dead. 
You know what I mean? Don't we? I mean, don't we? And the truth is, yes, we died with Christ. It's finished. But the fullness of apprehending that, the possessing of that, in reality, where we walk in the fullness of that, has not been settled in us. And so we feel that, and that should be not something that says, oh, leave me alone, but rather, oh, Lord, more application of the cross, more understanding of the Lamb of God, more seeing of the, of the truth. Because, I mean, we, we all have a, have a choice. I mean, we can follow Jesus or follow our own desires and lusts. Amen? Yeah. We, you know, we can do that. God's given us that choice. And it's not for me to pick on you and make you do that. Let me, let me just make something clear. If anybody feels a little bit uncomfortable about you know, how I'm talking, how much you've heard me talk this way many times before, if you feel any amount uncomfortable about it, this has nothing to do with Randy putting something on you. Okay? I, after I get it said, I'm going to walk off. Okay? This is between you and God. This has nothing to do with Randy, and this has nothing to do with Acts Bible School or New Creation Fellowship. This has everything to do with the absolute bottom line truth of what everything is about and if you go with it or miss it. And those decisions are made not 10 years from now. They're made every day. They're made right now. And that's part of what this whole thing that I want to share on right now, these tests, where you begin to make decisions now that, that you can't imagine. You, you, think, you think this is all about losing. You don't even know gain until you begin to really see the fullness of Christ. You have no clue of gain. You have no... Losing? Well, I'm losing my whiny old flesh. I'm losing... I lost... I gave up cigarettes for Jesus. You know? I gave my cussing to Jesus. He didn't want it. You know? But I mean, that's the stuff we bundle up and hand to Him and then walk around and tell everybody how proud we are what we gave up for Him. Let me tell you, everything about us is nothing compared to Him. It's not even worthy to be compared. And the glory and the rich, oh, the, I mean, listen to Paul, somebody who's seen, oh, the riches both of the glory and, of, of Christ and the length and the breadth and the height and the depth, and he just, oh, he's writing, and you know, just, man, the Lord is, but you know, that's not just, that's not just an apostle, that's somebody that's seen the Lord. That's somebody that's seen the Lord. I mean, the thing that I was writing about is, you know, Sheba, the queen of Sheba, the queen of Sheba came from a far country, came all that distance. She was a queen. She came all that distance to see the glory of Solomon. And a greater than Solomon is here. And when she got there with all of her array and all of her gifts, you know, when they come in one at a time showing all the different gifts and everything and laying them before the king and everything, and as she sat there and as she saw the king and as she saw the beauty of the king and of his court and of his servants and as she saw the, the order of, of everything and the glory of everything, it said she had no more spirit left in her. She was just dissipated. <laughs> the queen was no longer a queen. <laughs> Folks, the queen has to come down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that only happens. See, that doesn't, you know, the neat thing is the queen of Sheba, and Jesus said that. Jesus said, man, look at this woman. And she shall rise up in judgment against this generation. That's what Jesus said. You know? Said a great, and, and she did all that for Solomon. He said, a greater than Solomon's here, a greater court than Solomon, a greater beauty than Solomon, a greater wisdom than Solomon is here. There are, you know, good for you because I'm obviously on a roll now, but <laughs> there are songs out right now that say, oh, the wisdom of Solomon gives you wisdom. And I'm sitting there going, my God, I want the wisdom of Solomon. I want the wisdom that is Christ. Yeah. The wisdom from the mind. I don't want the wisdom of Solomon. Jesus said it. A greater than Solomon is here now. Why am I now talking about something way back then? We have the greater one. If we don't realize that, no wonder we're... Because you know, everything in this 
this is, a, is alive. Yeah. That's you know? right. You know, anything he touches. <laughs> Why are you picking on me? I'm not. You're just alive. <laughs> 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 I'm not picking on you. I'm just, you know, tough. You, know? you see? And we think, you know, well, the Lord's picking on me or this place is picking on me or something. And nobody's picking on you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. But he didn't die to, to hug up a big old hunk of flesh. You know, but, uh, that, that which he died to put away and the stench of it away, he didn't die to dig it up and then take that decrepit body that's decaying and hug it up and go, you sweet little thing, I love you. No. He died to bury you so that your stench would not affect the sweet savor of Christ through you. Amen? Yes. yes. The sweet savor of Christ through you. You think of, oh God, help me. You think of Noah. And here he is, he's a man that loves God. And I mean, he does. And so, so he begins to prepare. And he spends all of his life preparing. How many of you are preparing? Huh? How many are preparing? And how many of you just drifted? Preparing and preparing and preparing. And so the time comes and the flood comes and the flood doesn't just take away all those sinners and yucky people's life. It took away his life too. Everything he knew, everything that was familiar, every person he was used to, every place he was used to going, everything that he had, all of that was taken away. And he's brought into a burial thing called the ark. Shut up. One little light at the top and just, you know, and just shut in there. And for 40 days, wasn't it? 40 nights, he's in there and there's this, this stench after a while of animals. And, you know what I mean? The animals themselves plus the poop and all that. I mean, you know, you got, you know, like, oh, no, what a guy. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, you know, God, what a mess. And so, so finally, you know, he sends out that dove. And the dove representing the Holy Spirit because the dove descended upon Jesus or the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove comes back with an olive branch, life. And dove and an olive branch represents peace. You see it on even secular things. They'll have that. And it represents peace. It's God's own peace. It's all settled. There's a new creation. And so what happens? The man steps out of the ark and goes down and he offers a sacrifice and the Bible says that as that sacrifice went up there it was a sweet savior. Sweet savior of Christ. He entered into death. He lost all. He given it up. He entered into burial. The whole stench of that thing. And then the time came for coming out. And when he came out he didn't offer. He didn't walk out and go, Yeah! We're free! We're alive! He walked out and said, we're dead. Here's the sacrifice. I, I, and see, this was not a sacrifice for sin. That had already been taken care of. This was a sweet savor to the Lord. Amen? Sweet, there's a difference between sin offerings and sweet savor offerings. Sin offerings were for bad stuff done. You better offer it up or you're going to die because the substitute's taking your place. And if you don't offer it, then you go down. But the sweet savor offering is Christ in a, in a form of resurrection, ascending up. It is, it is death, burial, and resurrection by the nature of the Lamb, which has nothing to do with sin. The Lamb always was the Lamb and always will be the Lamb. He walks in death. He walks in life. It's all one and the same to Him. He's not, he's not looking forward to the day that he'll no longer be a lamb. You understand? The lamb is exalted, but the lamb is the lamb. Yes. And it is constant dying, but constant living. That's the nature of it. It's the way of it. It does not change. There is no death and resurrection. Okay, I'll go through this death, hold my breath, get through this, and come up in life. The life you come up in will be the Lamb, which is one that constantly gives Himself. The 
resurrected, exalted Jesus is a lamb on the throne. You don't graduate from the lamb. I mean, you know, I mean, I know, I know that I, for a long time, saw it like death and resurrection in the sense of, of uh, I just want to get through the death so that I can come up in the resurrection. And then I began to realize, that, wait a minute, you know, the lamb was the one who died, but he's still the lamb. And when you look at him on that throne, he appears as a lamb as though he had been slain. And then I realized, this is the nature of God. This is the way that he is. He's not, you know, we want to see some insulated, all-powerful thing that never, you know, before there was suffering, he would willingly lay down his life. See, it took suffering, it took sin, it took all of that to manifest that nature. But that's who he is. Amen? Yeah. I mean, if you want to know Jesus, this is knowing Jesus. Okay, it's not about, you know, I mean, I know a whole lot of churches, the all-powerful Jesus, the all-powerful Jesus lays his life down every day for you a million ways when you're selfish, you're self-centered, you don't, you don't walk out of the ark and go over there and immediately offer a sweet savor saying, it's all the Lord and, and I've been through death and I've been through burial and now I acknowledge that it is the sweet savor of Christ, the only thing left that I have to give, which is Christ in me. Christ through the sacrifice that is pleasing to you apart from the need for it. Sweet savor is offering has no need for it. Isn't that precious? What's wrong with Christianity today? We can't get out of the need. Everybody has a need. The altar is to go down and get your need met, not die. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't always that way, was it? Wasn't. Used to, you went down the altar and you, you gave up something. You didn't get something. <laughs> and you know, I mean, everybody in the church understood that. You, you know, if you go down that altar, you're gonna have to give something up. You know, nowadays it is nothing like that. You go down the altar, you get all sorts of stuff. I want to go to the altar. Really, that's the mentality. I want to go to the altar. I want to rush down to the altar and go, give me stuff. Oh, break me. Oh, now I have this kid. Oh, now I'm getting anything. Oh, now I'm getting. Oh, give me, give me, give me. I love the altar. It's the Christmas tree. <laughs> you know? That's not the way it is in the Word of God. And that's not the way it used to be in the old days. Boy, you went down to that altar, man. You went down there crying. And when you got up from there, you left something behind. Something of you. <laughs> something, you know, like that. And so that's what that's so that's the deal with Noah. I mean, he comes out and folks, he's he's been, he he did. You know, he didn't read about this. He went through. He went through death, burial, and resurrection. When he walked out of that ark, he knew that it was not his life. It was not about him. It was not his nature. It was not his goodness. It was nothing he had. He offered up that offering, and it says in God, God. Glory to God. You know, somebody in their mind right now knows the story and says, Yeah, but didn't he turn right around and get drunk? And, you know, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Because you know what ascended up? Was that Noah? Did Noah ascend up? No. That was a sweet savor of Christ. He's still a mess. Jesus is his hope. Jesus is still your hope even after you come out of junk. When you're doing good, Jesus is your hope. And so, you know, I mean, we, you'll never get to a place where you don't need Jesus. I know a lot of Christians are trying to get to a place where they don't need Jesus. That's the exact, I mean, that is so stupid. You know, I mean, I want to get so good and so mature, I won't need Jesus anymore. What? Yeah, yeah, you know, and then we can start my own heaven. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean then, you know, because you know, I'll be good all by myself. I won't need you. And, you know, I'll visit his heaven from time to time and say, thank you for, you know, 
setting me straight, but now I'm straight. You ain't straight, you'll never be straight. You're a mess. You are a total mess. You are unrepairable. Christ is your hope. You know, I mean, this is uh, this used to be the regular teaching in the church. It used to be the regular teaching in the church that, that depravity meant everything was depraved. There was no hope for anything. The fallen creation was fallen. And, I mean, you know, and that funny, you know, it's just like, oh my God, oh, I guess we, we left that out now. Now there's hope for stuff. You know, what does that sign say on that North Texas thing as you get up there across from only the educated are free. One day. I can't say that because then you'll feel dumb. Only the educated are free. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. There are people that don't have a great education that are greater men of God than anybody who's had a great education. And I'm not against education, but I tell you what. I notice that you're not over at UNT, you're sitting over here. Sure. And why? I believe it's because you know that it's not self-improvement that's going to make the difference. It's Christ that makes the difference. Now wouldn't it be stupid to come over here and spend three years and not get that and settle that and go through the death and go through the burial and go through the stench and go through the stuff and, and experience it and have it stick to you and every day deal with it. And, uh, this whole thing is poop! <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's a bunch of crap! <laughs> But the way the Lord sees me is not through this. He sees me in Christ. And I must go through the process and settle this stuff. Because if you don't, you're going to take your little oodles of crap and offer them to God in the future. You will. And you'll, you won't have settled some things. And you'll think that God's real pleased with you. And you're walking to the throne room going, hey, this is some of my best poop. <laughs> and you're going to really think that he should be pleased with you. Oh, you're so precious to give me poo. <laughs> Your best poo. You know? <laughs> God. And you think, I mean, you think I'm joking. That's what it's like, man. Man at his best is altogether vanity. That's what it says in the Bible. Your book. And you either believe that or you don't. And if you believe that, then why do you get so disappointed when you fail? Huh? Why don't you go, well, I should have expected that. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I turn to me, this is what it comes out. Boom! <laughs> and I'm getting used to it, and I'm settling it in my heart. And now, when I walk out of this thing, I'm not going to go, oh, I'm free, I'm better, I'm alive. I'm... You're going to walk out going, I already have, I know what I am. I still have this savor on me. So I'm going to offer to God something that will please Him. And you offer up the lamb. And when you do, woo, God smells a sweet savor. And it, you know what? It's like Nisi was sharing on, on the, uh, Martha poured out that alabaster box. You know, those people had been around death for quite a while there. You know? Lazarus had died. They'd been around death. The smell of death was all around the place. That fragrance fills the room and overshadows everything. Fills it up. And Jesus said, boy, you understand death and burial, don't you? The only hope to get over death and burial is a resurrected, ascending incense that fills the whole thing up, overshadows it, and is accepted in spite of everything else. Amen? Yeah. Jesus said, you did this in preparation for my death and burial. Because I'm coming up, baby. Coming up in the arms of the Father, in the reality of my Father, a whole other realm. And everywhere this gospel is preached, this should be a memorial to you. You know? How, how do we know that 
She comprehended death and burial. How do we see that? How do we, how do we know that? Well, how do we not just think that she just showed up with an alabaster box and broke it and, you know, just like anybody else doing a favor for Jesus or blessing him or something, that she was clueless. How, you know, how, I mean, like everybody else was clueless about his death and burial, weren't they? Everybody was clueless. The disciples ran away and hid. They didn't know what was going on. Everyone was clueless. How do we know that she knew this? Because Jesus knew. He's the only one that knows. He knows the real from the fake. Why? Did she say anything different? No, it wasn't. it's not based on what you say. Did she do anything different? Not based on what you do. Two were grinding, one taken. Two were walking up the hill, one taken. They're both doing the same thing. Wasn't what you do. He knows. He doesn't know like we know. See, that's our problem. We say, well, you know, when I see so-and-so, or when I feel so-and-so, or when I, no, no, no. He has... Let me just put it like this, a dumb way to put it. He has ways of sensing that are beyond our senses. And we are supposed to develop those. For example, the two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. Walking along, ignorant, had no clue, they don't know. Well, we had hoped he was the one. We didn't know. Yeah, I mean, they just, I mean, dumb in the sense of, I mean, it's clear they don't know. You understand what I mean? I'm not being harsh or anything. I'm just saying, they're just, they're just in the dark. They don't know. What happens? Jesus draws near. Jesus reveals himself. Jesus shares the word. Jesus, 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 Jesus. An opening, a seeing, a recognition, a communion takes place. And what do they do? What do they do? They were on their way away from Jerusalem. They immediately turn back and go to Jerusalem where Jesus next appears. They show up where he shows up. Did Jesus say anything to them about his next, my next big appearance will be in Buffalo in two weeks? <laughs> Did he do anything like that? No, he didn't tell them where he was going to be. How did they know? I'll tell you how they know. Man, you get in his presence, just like the Queen of Sheba and everything, you don't just visit. You get in there and you spend time and you start taking it all in and you're taking in the Lord and the opening is so powerful that it affects you. And when I say affects you, I don't mean where you straighten up and fly, right? Forget it. Go try to fly. You're going to crash. I mean, it's not that kind of junk. I'm talking about where it's like that which is him permeates into you and now you don't have the thoughts of Christ. You don't have the instructions of Christ written down for you to go. You're permeated with Christ and you show up where He shows up. That's leadership. That's leadership. Get somebody so in tune with the Lord that wherever He appears, you're going to appear. When He appears, you appear also. Amen? But that doesn't just happen. That doesn't happen by you walking up to somebody going, I'm an anointed man of God and I'm going to give it to you. Folks, that happens when you get into the presence of the Lord. And the, when I say the presence, I don't just mean the goosebump presence. I mean, you get into the presence of the Lord and the understanding, the reality, the seeing, the, I mean, an opening that just changes you. It, it, the, that which is Him comes into you, and now you know. You don't know why you know. You don't know what you know. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're, you don't have a computer storehouse of knowledge that you have developed over the years of training and teaching and of study so that you have one of the highest speed computers around and when the need comes up, it goes, here's the answer. And it comes up on the screen and you go, boom! And everybody goes, oh, good show. That's what we want. That's what we want. We want to spend time studying 
instead of spending time in the presence of the Lord, being permeated by Him, so that when you speak, you don't speak sermon, you speak as of the oracles of God. The oracles of God. And when you, when you speak the Word, it's not just teachings and subjects and stuff. The life, the reality is behind it, is in it, is flowing out of it. It's the sweet savor of Christ. Amen? The sweet savor of Christ is just there, and you go, oh my, that's Jesus. You know? It's not an understanding, but it is. You see what I'm saying? It's not an understanding of things. It's an understanding of Him, but it's not an understanding of, like, He's there and you're here, and now I understand you. It is an understanding of more of us going into Him almost as we are, we are not. Like, like the Queen of Sheba, who finally, it's just too much for her. My goodness. All her spirit is just dissipated in her. She has no spirit left in her. And that's what happens is you just go, it's the greatest victory you ever saw. And you just go, I have no spirit left. In me. I just have nothing left to give. I've seen it all, and it's Jesus. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? You're, you're not left without anything. Again, the exchange is tremendous. It's not about what you lost, all your junk and foolish, you know, like, you know, all this stuff I was writing on yesterday, sitting in my car, just writing, just writing, and just enjoying the Lord. It's like a child in the nursery. You put a bunch of children in the nursery. When we were children, we spoke as children, we acted as children, da, da, da. and here they are. One of them, and you watch this. If you've never seen this, one picks up a toy and really seems to enjoy it, and the other goes, I want it!
because you're moving toward Him. You're moving away from things. You're moving away from earth life. You're moving away from things that perish. To perish. And most of our toys here perish quicker than we want them to, you know? Yeah. I mean, remember I got a new car and the next week it was down. <laughs> I got it up and you know, I mean, you, you just don't get your hope too quick. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's the way our Christian life feels. <laughs> and then pretty soon we go, I don't even want to be happy anymore because God's going to take it from me. And that's not what's going on. I'm sure a child will think that, won't they? And part of the problem with the child is, the reason why that child is so frustrated is, it only wants what everybody else has. You know what I mean? If it just found a toy over in the corner and nobody else wanted you know what I mean? No, no, they all look at each other and go, you know, it's a one room. The whole room plus me. You know? I mean, anybody watched the nursery before? I have. I know what I'm talking about. So, you know, God's work is, God's work is not slapping hands, folks. That does not mature us. Even, now imagine this, even if you get a child and you slap his hand, you know, you know, he's in a little Catholic nursery and Sister Mary Elizabeth is hitting <laughs> a ruler enough times on the hand <laughs> that he, you know, when, when he goes, I want in, and Sister Mary Liz was wondering, oh, you know, that kid has not changed. Because you let Sister Mary Liz would leave the room back for that toy. The heart still wants that. He wants maturity, not actions that seem to be the right thing. Amen? Yeah. So now, now believe that, and those of you that keep adjusting your behavior, stop it. And start crying out for maturity. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Because you put yourself under the law, and one of the things that happens is, is that if you do pretty good, you think that you're good. And again, you're not. You're dumb. You're poop. You're, you know, you have the stench of it. You've lived in it. You've tried to clean it up. You've you know, your whole existence, apart from the sweet savor of Christ, is that. And if you have been buried in the likeness of his death, and you've gone down into that, and you've comprehended that he never would have died if you hadn't been so wretched that you needed to die. He didn't need to die. Amen? I mean, he didn't need to die. He never did anything wrong. He died to put to death the stench and the sorriness of us. Yeah. And to put it away to impart himself. And to join to us and call us bride and beloved and precious. And, and his heart never changes, does it? But we think it changes because... We hide ourselves from our own flesh, and when it pops up, we think he just noticed it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? We go, oh my God, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm so sorry. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he goes, I saw it there all along. It's always been there. It has? Yeah. It didn't just show up, it just manifested. But it didn't just show up, it's been there. That's you. So then you put apologizing for everything you do and you start seeking God to be conformed to the image of Christ. You, you don't convert old things. You let them pass away. Hello? And then what happens? It's called, this is a real weird couple of words here, new creation. New creation. Then. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. Not converted, not fixed, not blessed. Pass away. You join with another 
and you become one with him, his interests become your interests. Amen? Yeah. All right, well, gee, that was a quick hour.